became a free man that day. The prison walls started falling, and I am a free man today. Good morning. Welcome to Cowboy Church this morning. I just like to let you know that the restrooms are over here to your left, right outside that door on the right are the restrooms. And I just want to welcome everybody here today. Please join me in prayer this morning. Lord, thank you for the opportunity to come into your house this morning. Lord, it is a privilege to be in this place. Lord, thank you, Lord, that your Holy Spirit is on the inside of us, teaching us, revealing your truths to us, Lord. Lord, I pray for a clear vision in this place today, Lord, that you would open our eyes so that we could see things through your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Does anybody have any praises or prayer requests this morning? Well, good morning. How's everyone doing today? Um, they asked me to lead the prayer, and it's an absolute pleasure, too. Um, but as we stand here today, as we worship here today, I really do believe that prison walls will be falling today. Everybody say amen. Amen. I agree for that. Um, everybody here, their story is different. And I really do. I'm a big believer in community. Uh, I'm a local coach here. I coach high school ball and I coach uh, little league baseball. And I'm always talking about community. And, and the kids, the little kids, the little league, they always say community commu because commu they can't quite say community. But the older kids, they, they just love it, and, and they're praying for their communities. Um, so as a coach, as a coach and as a member of this community, I'm excited to be a part of it. I'm excited to be here today because I really do feel like those prison walls will be falling today. For, for the older generation, for the younger generation, for the guys and, and men and women in the middle, and even the unborn kids today, I feel, I feel like Jesus will bless us all in our own way. Um, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father God. Thank you. Thank you for the many blessings that you've given us, Father God. I pray right now just for everyone under the sound of my voice right now, Father God, that we can lean and learn from you today. We can lean on you and we can learn from your stories and from your scripture, scriptures of what's happened in the past, but we can change the future with your word and what we believe in you. Father God, I pray just for these messages and I pray that, that it can impact someone's life in a strong, mighty way, the same way you did, Father God. When you spoke things into existence and it just happened. When, when, when you spoke things into existence and it just, the whole world came about, uh, we came about, the trees, the animals, the birds came about, Father God. And we're just so thankful for the many blessings that you've given us. Father God, I'm thankful for the band up here today, Father God, because as they lead us in the holy of holy worships today, Father God, we can be a congregation and we can be a church that stands up mighty and powerful Father God, I'm so thankful for that. I'm thanking you for our leaders in the church, Father God, our pastors, and, and the men and women that are praying for us on a daily basis, Father God. I know as a, as a young man who's about to start a family, I know I can feel those prayers from my church, and I'm so thankful for it. Father God, I, I continue to pray for my community. I continue to lift up our police officers and our, and our firefighters and our teachers, Father God. I continue to, to, to lift up the many jobs that are here that are present, Father God, and I pray right now just for each and one of us, the, uh, each one of the households that are represented here today, Father God. I pray for the older generation. I pray for the younger generation, Father God, and I pray for the unborn babies that are still in their mother's wombs. Father God, continue to bless us all, continue to guide us, and we're so thankful for the many blessings that's going to happen today, this morning, Father God. I know they've been happening the past couple days, but I believe that a, a blessing will happen today. Father God, thank you. And all of our church says, Amen. Amen. Okay, I'm going to share announcements with you. This is a little bit different for me, so um, this is all they're going to let me do today. So you just uh, you be thankful for that. <laughs> all right. So remember, uh, dinners will be served every Tuesday at 6 p.m. Miss Diane's asking you to RSVP her. 
her number being 863-342-2399. If, you, if you're wanting to just get a bulletin, you can have the number so you can RSVP her so she'll know about how much food. She's always going to have a little extra, so if you happen to forget to do that, please come on anyhow and get you something to eat because there'll be extra. She's going to make a little extra, but she just don't want to get caught off guard. And then don't remember, or remember this coming Tuesday now, the women's Bible study in his image as Miss Diane leads that as well. And then don't forget next Sunday now, next Sunday being Mother's Day, don't forget about your mothers. And then we'll be at both locations next Sunday. We'll be here at 11 and at Venus at 10. So please come to, to either place. And then uh, James is there on the 10th, on that Tuesday the 10th at 6.30 p.m., walking in the divine healing. As you see that being manifested here in the last few days as he's been leading the group into that, getting everyone ready and prepared to receive what Chad has been sharing and teaching over, the, over these last few days. So, and it'll just continue on that. It's not gonna stop after today. I want you to realize that. Your divine healing does not stop after Chad leaves. This is just the beginning of it. Don't see it as the end. See it as the beginning of your divine healing that God has put in you for you to have all the days of your life. Amen? And then, um, and then also, uh, this is something else I want to share. I had uh, the, uh, the study group now on the 15th. Now, is when our, uh, our study group will start back up, Bible study with, uh, with all ages. The kids in here with Trish and, and Lily and then the, the ladies over there with my wife. And then the men have got them a new teacher. And his name is Ken. And he's going to stand up and show himself. He didn't know I was going to do that to him. Yeah. So, I, and, and the reason I want to share that with you is another thing, too, that I introduced, now I'm going to take full credit, full blame, full everything for this. I introduced a book into this teaching about going and teaching into 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy. Well, there's something wrong with the author of the book, and we've had a lot of controversy. So I'm asking, and, and, and we've already come into this agreement, we're going to put the book aside. So any of you that's not been wanting to go because you have trouble with the author, that you have no excuse now. Because now we're going to go straight to the Bible, and we're going to use the Bible to interpret the Bible. So then you've got a problem with God if you're not willing to go. So, uh, so, so that's how it's going to go from here on. So I'm going to ask you now to bring the books back to me so I can take care of them. So anybody that's got a book, I'm going to ask you to bring it back to me. And, um, and, then, and then, like I said, Ken's going to go, and, and, um, and, and we're going to start doing this because the ladies are in Psalms 119 now. Come there. If you want to dive into the Bible deeper, come to those, those small groups where you can ask questions, you can be a part of, and it's a whole lot different than it is just coming here on Sunday. So I encourage you to come and be a part of that. Um, and then don't forget about Tuesday and Wednesday nights. We're at the practice pen out there. We'll rope calves on Tuesday, rope steers on Wednesday. We have a devotional time that my, my daughter leads at around 7.30 uh, on those nights. And then um, another thing, too, I want to um, share with you. Senior recognition, May the 22nd. Senior recognition, May the 22nd. If you're a senior and you've not got with me, please get with me. We have gifts for you, and so we want to make sure you get those gifts on that day as we pray over you. And then another thing is, and don't forget about it, is diaper drop. So uh, for Tony Marie and Chris, which sits up here in the front, and, and they're just a few weeks away, a few weeks away from having a baby to, that both of them can hold. Right now she holds it. But in a few weeks, he'll get the opportunity to hold it. And uh, so I just ask you to, to shower them with diapers and wipes. And if you'll just bring them and drop them off at the back of the, at the church, that'll be great. And then uh, Smith Wigglesworth, thought of the week. In spite of my meekness, in spite of my humility, and in spite of my helplessness, all that God has is mine. Amen. Amen. Thank you. God bless you. Please stand and worship this morning.
is my shepherd he goes before me defender behind me I
ago before I know that you even got to end my war. You come back with the head of my enemy. You come back and you call it my victory.
Shepherd struck, the sheep are scattered, still I'm stuck, hide a pattern, come and go and go and come and go again. I know you've won the victory, but the slope I'm on is slippery, the storms are gonna hit me now and then. What is my hope? your promise in your truth in your faithfulness that too every day you're making changes in my soul you're the righteous soul provider but you put me through the fire if i'm gonna give my life i gotta choose where i build and what i sure look easy life forever without misery but the flesh that is living in me is holding on I only make the right decisions through your son who's died in prison he has paid for the permission to bring me into all You may stand in fellowship this morning or continue in worship.
Well, good morning. What a powerful, powerful time of worship. So I wanted to, before I introduce Chad, I wanted to first, I got to put my little paperweight on there so it doesn't blow. Uh, my Bible doesn't blow. But I want to just, as I've, been, as I've been recalling and hearing testimonies and hearing things this past weekend, I wanted to just share some of the things that I know have happened um, throughout this weekend. So the first one that just blows me away this morning is Mr. Ken, whenever I, I walk by him this morning, Mr. Ken, he, he's got his cane, but he didn't have his, his little wheelie cart thing. And so this morning he said he got up and he realized that he didn't need it whenever he got out of bed. So praise God for that. That's just one. Look at that. Come on now. <laughs> praise God. I know we've had food allergies healed. We've had the seasonal allergies healed. We've had um, the uh, boot that no longer was needed that was needed for how long was the boot ne needed? Since last year, okay? We've seen lower backs healed last night. We saw nerves that were uh, causing, he couldn't put weight on a foot that was restored. We have seen, what else am I missing? I know I, well, there's been more. They don't look at me like a calf at a new gate. Come on now. Any? What else have we seen? Yes. He can lift his arm. There you go. Okay. We've seen frozen shoulders that, um, you know, that have been healed. So th th this is just, it's been such a powerful weekend. And the one, the one statement the Lord just keeps showing me is the in Christ scriptures. And I know Chad's going to talk more about that this morning. But before we do that, I want to read a verse out of Luke 4.18, okay? This is Luke 4.18. And as, as I read this, I want you to s begin to see yourself. These, this is Jesus talking, and he's fulfilling a prophecy out of Isaiah 61, okay? And it says, it says here that the Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So if you're in Christ, you have Jesus in your heart, okay? The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. So you can say that same thing. Because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recovery of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. So praise God for that scripture. I want you to know, as Chad gets up here in just a moment and begins to teach, to know that the same, the same Jesus that's in him... You've heard us talk about that this weekend. The same Jesus that's in him, that the Lord has, has anointed him to preach the gospel to the poor, is the same Jesus that's in you. Stephanie doesn't get a different version than me. We all have the same Jesus, okay? So I want you to understand that same Jesus is in you. And so my prayer is that throughout this weekend, go, we're going to have, every, it was live streamed last night, we're going to make sure that everything's posted on YouTube, and we'll get everything to Chad as well. But so he can he can continue to share these teachings. But I want you to know that in Christ, nothing is impossible. And I'm going to share one more thing before I before I pass the pass the torch over to Mr. Chad. So as I w as last night, whenever I got home, got the got the kids in bed and I'm just laying there. And I'm just my mind, Lord, and just praying and the Lord's just showing me different things. And I, I know that we have, it's been, we, we, we've seen a lot of the physical healings, okay? But the Lord began to share with me that there has been, remember yesterday out of, out of Psalm 27, that the, the, the brokenhearted, okay? And this verse right here in, out of Luke 4, talking about healing the brokenhearted, this morning, that we're going to see that this morning. We're going to see hearts that have been broken. We're going to see trauma that's been, that has traumatic situations that happen to people. We're going to see that restored but you've got, to, you've got to know that that same Jesus that wants to heal something physically, wants to heal something emotionally, wants to break fear, wants to break anxiety. So, Mr. Chad Gonzalez, come on, big guy. Back, we've got these, and... Chad said to throw books at everybody. So I, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to put them all in the back because if you want them, all the books that are there, we're covering. We're, we're, we're making sure that he gets compensated for that or his ministry does. So if there's a book back there that you want, go grab it, okay? And um, like we mentioned yesterday, you know, a lot of these books, there's, there's about three or four of them that when we go into different countries, we've been getting these translated into the languages of those countries that we go to. And so 
I know the church is covering these for, I mean, that's a pretty good deal. Who doesn't like free? I mean, so they're sowing into you. Um, but, you know, when you go and you buy these, like, the money is going and helping to translate these books into different languages. And so there are several of those. We, we've got some in Korean, uh, Chinese, that Think Like Jesus devotional has been used in a bunch of uh, Bible, underground Bible schools in China. And uh, alternate realities getting translated into uh, Bulgarian and Nor uh, Norwegian this summer. And Walking the Miraculous is getting translated Norwegian. Possessive Life is in Spanish and in Farsi. Um, this has been really cool, seeing what God's doing with those things. And so, but when you participate in that, you're also helping other pastors around the world get these, because we give these to the pastors for free. Uh, the one that we translated into Farsi, Possessors of Life, and we talked about that some last night. We had a thousand, we printed a thousand of those this summer, this past summer. So a thousand pastors got a copy of that to take back to their church. Because a lot of those pastors, they don't even have Bibles. And so, uh, so we're one of many, many, many gets to, to put resources into their hands as well. And so I also want to say thank you. There's, I know there's a lot of people that's come in from uh, different parts of the state and then some other states that's come in, driven in for the weekend. And so it's always really humbling to meet you guys. Some of y'all are partners with us, uh, with our ministry. And so it's just very humbling the fact that you would take the time and spend the money just to come your, uh, spend your weekend with us. And so very, very appreciate that. Uh, hey, I don't get to do this often because they're not with me a whole lot, but uh, my wife Lacey and Jake are here, and so you all want to stand up and turn around. Everybody's been asking where you're at. So this is, this is Lacey. <clears throat> and, uh, and then my son Jake, he, uh, he looks 19, but he's only 13, so. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Yeah, I just want to say this. It's always an honor to, to be invited to other churches. My wife, Lacey, and I, we pastored for 15 years. We had started two different churches. And so being on that one side uh, for 15 years it's, and then being now on this side, it truly makes you appreciate all the hard work and the sacrifices, everything that goes in. Because a lot of times people think, you know, the pastoring piece is just getting up here and standing up in front of people and talking. That's the fun part. It's all the stuff that goes on behind the scenes, all the work, all the volunteers, you know, all the people that are back there uh, teaching the children and people running the media and sound. And a lot of times we, we kind of forget about all that stuff. And uh, so very appreciative to, to be invited here. And, you know, the other thing is this. You don't find a lot of churches that not only believe in divine healing, believe in healing, but also teach it and then also get results with it. That is like, that's hard to come by. And so I'm just thrilled to even be here and, and Pastor James is telling me about some things that they've been experiencing or y'all been experiencing here. And, and then I got really, really excited that when I left yesterday morning to go to Tampa to pick them up, people were getting healed afterward and it wasn't me. I like that. Because that's, what, that's been one of my things is I don't want it being about me or any other one particular individual. It's supposed to be about the everyday believer, the everyday Joe Blow believer, you know, walking and doing the things that Jesus did. Because Jesus said what? Whoever believes in me will do the very same works and greater works because I'm going to the Father. He didn't say the pastor. He didn't say the apostle, prophet, the evangelist, the teacher. He didn't say the bishop. He didn't, you know, he didn't mention how many... Uh, initials you had to have after your last name or diplomas on your wall. He said the believer. So if you've received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you're qualified. You're qualified. And uh, Friday night, we, we spent a lot of time talking about your union with Christ and, and teaching you who you really are. And then um, Saturday morning, we talked about the fact that you're dead to sin and you're dead to sickness and disease because sin is the root the sin of Adam and sickness and disease, poverty, lack, and, and, and depression, addiction, all the mental issues, those are all fruits of that. And the Bible says that when Jesus set us free, not only did he redeem us from, from the root, from the source, then he also automatically redeemed us from all the byproducts too. That's good news. And then last night we found out we've got this life, this healing power on the inside of us. So for many of us who think that God's been holding out on us, I've got good news for you. He's actually a good, good father. And through Christ, he gave you everything that you would ever need. It's already there. 
And so I would encourage you, once they get those posted, go back and, and look at those things. Those books are back there. They're free for you. So no excuses to be ignorant anymore. <laughs> it's free. But I want to help you with something this morning. This will not only help you in the area of, of understanding how Satan works against us, but it's also going to help you in the area of healing, and it will help you in the area of the mental stuff. And, and, and I'm very appreciative of the fact that Pastor James brought that up because this is something I've been seeing more and more is this area of the mental issues, the depression, the anxiety. You look at everything that's going on over the last couple of years, and that's beginning to increase. And sadly, when it comes to the mental issues, it's becoming to, to become normalized in the church. Okay, it's not supposed to be normal. It's not supposed to be normal that you're depressed and having panic attacks and, and anxiety. And it's become normalized just like uh, flu and flu season is normal and allergies in spring season is normal. And we just act like it's normal. And what do we do? We just look to pop a pill for it. And that's not the way that God designed and created this. So if you would, I want you to turn, um, turn to Isaiah chapter 14. If you don't know where it's at, it's over in the, in the first part of your Bible in the Old Testament. If you can't find it within the next 10 seconds, I'm sure they'll have it on the screen for you. Isaiah chapter 14. And this is talking about Lucifer. This is Satan uh, before he sinned and was kicked out of, out of, out of heaven. Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12 through 15 says this. It says, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son in the morning, son of the morning? How are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? Notice verse 13. He said, for you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farthest sides of the north. And I'm going to ascend above the heights of the clouds, and I will be like the Most High. And yet you shall be brought down to Sheol to the lowest depths of the pit. Here you have, this is what was going on with, with Lucifer, who we now know as Satan, before Adam and Eve, before all this was going on. He was on the earth, and he was ruling over the earth. I don't know that a lot of people realize that, but he was ruling over the earth. He was, he was in that position. And then he starts having these thoughts, these ideas, these imaginations of, hey, you know, I'm so big and bad, I think I'm better than God. And so I want my throne to be his throne. I'm going to ascend up into heaven, and I'm basically going to kick God off his throne. And the Bible tells us that as he began to think on these things, that this became a reality to him. And what happened? Those imaginations turned into manifestations, and he and a third of the angelic army tried to basically kick God out. It'd actually make a pretty good movie. I don't, I don't know about you. It'd be a pretty good movie. But this is what happened, and this is how Lucifer got kicked out of heaven, lost the anointing, and became Satan that we know today. It was Satan's imaginations that turned into manifestations that got him kicked out and made him lose all that he had. Well, as you continue down the road of this story, you find Adam and Eve, or God creates Adam and Eve in the garden. And we spent a lot of time on Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27, that said God made man and woman in his image and his likeness. Notice he made man and woman equal, right? Made equal, man and woman, in God's image and his likeness. This was not a particular denomination. This was not your favorite TV preacher. This was God who said this. We're going to make man and woman in my image and in my likeness. Let's make them to be like us. Well, then you get to Genesis chapter 3. I want you to turn to Genesis chapter 3. And look at what it says about Eve and Adam and this famous tree. In Genesis chapter 3 and in verse 1, it says, The serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, has God indeed said you shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit of the trees of the garden, but of the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said you shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you will die. And the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Now, isn't that interesting? In Genesis chapter 1, when God creates man and woman, 
God said, let's make man and woman to be in our image and in our likeness. Let's make them to be like us. So he makes man and woman in his image. He makes them to be like him. Then Satan comes along and tells Eve, hey, if you'll eat of this fruit, you'll be like God. You'll be like God. And she said, well, if we eat of this, you know, God said that we would die. He said, you will not surely die. Eat of the fruit, you'll become like God. Notice what it says in verse 6. I think a lot of times we kind of just pass over this. But this is vitally important. In verse 6 it says, So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food. Now this was not the first time that Eve saw that tree. She'd been seeing that tree all over the place. Every time they walked by, the tree is there. It wasn't the first time that she physically saw that tree. What was happening? Satan is bringing these thoughts, these ideas, and these suggestions that if you'll do this, you'll become like God. And she sat there and thought about it and thought about it long enough till all of a sudden it changed her perception of that tree. She had been seeing the tree physically. It wasn't that all of a sudden, you know, she was blind and now I can see the tree. No, what happened? Because her imaginations began to change, she's mulling this over. Now she's seeing that tree differently. And it was the great deception because the Bible says that she saw that it was good for food. It was pleasant to the eyes and it was desirable to make one wise. She took of its fruit and she ate and she gave it to her husband who was standing right beside her watching the whole thing. Not being a man that day, not being a good husband that day. He's watching the whole thing. See, a lot of times we blame Eve. We ought to blame Adam. Adam was the doofus that day. Amen. Uh, That was for the women right there. Adam was the one that just messed up. But they ate of the fruit and they died spiritually. Now, here's the interesting thing is that they were already made in the image and likeness of God. God had made them to be like him. And they had authority and dominion over all of the earth. You read it there, verse 20, Genesis 1, 26, 27, 28. God gave them dominion. And it was to this place that Satan had no authority in their life. He could not make them do anything. So what did Satan have to do? Because he had no authority and they had all authority, Satan had to be a deceiver. He had to be a liar. He had to be a tempter. And so he comes to deceive them. He comes to lie to them. He comes to bring these thoughts and these ideas and these suggestions to get them to begin to imagine, to have these thoughts in their imaginations. Because Satan knew if you will imagine something long enough, that will become your reality. And what is your reality? You will act on it. What, what is real to you in your mind that is what you will automatically put your faith on. And what you put your faith on, it will produce every single time, whether good or bad. But it was the great deception because Eve was already made like God. She was already made in the image and likeness of God. She was already there. But the Bible tells us in, uh, in the New Testament that she was deceived, that Satan deceived her. She didn't really know who she was. So as he's sitting there and saying, if you'll do this, if you'll do this, if you'll do this, you'll become like God. The, the sad part of the, of the story is she was already like God. And so what does Satan do? He brings these thoughts and these ideas and suggestions and says, if you'll do this, you'll become like God. And Satan already knew she was. Satan already knew she was already like God. But Eve didn't. This is why it's so vitally important you actually know who you are in Christ. You know who you are. Satan knew she was like God, but he, he knew he had no authority over her, so he had to bring the thoughts and the ideas and, and the suggestions to get her to begin to change her imaginations, change her perceptions, because it would produce. It is what got him kicked out of heaven. It's what made him lose what he had, his imaginations. And it, it's, just, it's one of the saddest stories in the Bible because here you have Adam and Eve. Here you have Eve. She's made to be like God, but she doesn't know it. So she goes to work to become what she already is, and as a result, lost who she was. And why was all that going on? Because Satan had no authority in her life. Satan so had no authority in Adam's life. No authority. And so because he had no authority, he couldn't make them sin. 
He couldn't make them do squat. So what did he do? He had to bring a thought, an idea, and a suggestion so that they would do something with it. Well, the result of that is they sinned. They died spiritually. They lost out on the life of God like we saw last night. But we have to understand that our imagination, it is absolutely powerful. God is the one who gave us our imagination. It is from the imaginations of God that the world was created. It's from our imaginations that is what our reality becomes. What is real to you in your mind, again, that's what you're going to put your faith on. And that's what you're going to experience. There's a very familiar scripture in Isaiah chapter 20, uh, 26. Let's look at this real quick. We're over there in Isaiah. I guess I should have just had you hold your place there. Isaiah chapter 26 and verse 3. I'm sure a lot of you have heard this before. Isaiah 26 and verse 3 says, You will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. How many of you ever heard that scripture before? You'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you. In the Hebrew, that word mind, it's literally the word imaginations. It's translated as imaginations or deep thought. This is not just some fleeting thought that comes your way. This is something that you're, you're chewing on, you're meditating on, you're thinking on. He said, you will keep him in perfect peace, shalom, nothing missing, nothing broken. Healing, health, safety, protection, refuge, prosperity. You'll keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on you, whose imaginations are stayed on you because he trusts in you. So notice this, whatever your, whatever your thoughts are on, whatever your imaginations are on, that reveals where your trust is at. Or you can say it like this, whatever your imaginations are on, that's where your faith is going to be. Remember we made the comment last night, a lot of us think we have a faith problem, but no, in reality we've got imagination problems. Whatever you're imagining whatever you're meditating on, whatever you're thinking on, that is what's going to be your reality, and that, as a result, is what you're going to put your faith on, and as a result, that is what you're going to experience. Satan knows that. He knows that. But remember, with Eve and Adam, before the fall, before they died spiritually, he had no authority. Well, when Jesus comes along, Jesus came to get our authority back. And If that doesn't make any sense, go listen to Friday night. Jesus came and got our authority back. He came and got our dominion back. He came to unite us with the Father once again. And Jesus makes this statement to the disciples. He said, all authority, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. And he gave it to the church right before he went to sin on high. So in other words, it comes down to this, that because of salvation, our authority got back into our hands. We've got authority and dominion. The same authority and dominion that God gave Adam and Eve in Genesis chapter 1. He gave us that authority and dominion back. Well, if we have all authority, that means what? All the smart people. Satan has none. I mean, a kindergartner could figure that out. If you have all authority, that means Satan has no authority. Right? So, I mean, that right there, that, that's room right there, that, that's excuse to shout because a lot of us think that we're against some big bad devil that can just make us do anything and everything. No, we've got all authority. That means Satan has none. That means you're right back in the very same spot that Adam and Eve were in relationship to Satan. This is why the, in the New Testament, the Bible refers to Satan as a deceiver, refers to him as a liar. Jesus said, he's a liar, the father lies, there is no truth in him at all. So guys, this is good news. When Satan comes and brings these thoughts and these ideas and suggestions that says, you're going to die, well, that's a lie. If he could kill you, he would have already done it. But he can't. And the good news is, he can't make you sin. Now all of you that, you know, I used to work in the prison system in Texas for a couple of years and and I hear these guys say that, you know, I just couldn't help myself. I, I was beating on my wife and doing this and that. She'd just make me mad. I'd lose my temper. I couldn't help myself. But it was always interesting to me that, you know, this guy would walk along. I can't help myself. But some dude, 6'4", 250, walks along, you know, pecks out to here and biceps bulging in his, in his little jumper there. And, 
And he goes and picks on the guy and says something to him, and the guy just turns around and walks off. So you couldn't control yourself with your little five foot four Y, but you can control yourself with a six foot four, two fifty linebacker. You can control it. You can control it. Satan can't make you do anything. The only way he can get you to do something is to bring a thought, an idea, a suggestion to get you to start imagining. And that's how he gets you to sin. The Bible says over in James that he tells us how that we are tempted, how that we sin. He said, no man can sin unless he be tempted by his own desires. And those own desires are conceived. See, you have to understand that your imagination, your imagination is where things are conceived. And then it's, it's because of your faith that bursts those things into our lives. Your imagination is in one way like a factory. And you are the factory owner. And whatever you put on that factory line, that is what's going to be produced. But Satan is like the salesman. And he comes and he's trying to sell you a new product. Trying to get you to put it on the, on the factory line. He can't put it on the line. He can't get you to produce it. But he can bring the thought, the idea, the suggestion. You know, to get you to, to create that. That's where things are birthed, is right here. Now, I don't know about you, but I grew up in church, and when I grew up in church, they never talked about our imagination. When they did, it was always on the sin side. See, we're so sin conscious, we can't even preach on things at church without going to the sin side. The thing that God gave us to create and to produce in this world, we were only talking about the sin side. So I would be in youth group, and the only time they would talk about our imagination, they'd tell the boy, hey, boys, you know, watch your thoughts. Don't be thinking about girls that way. Don't be seeing them that way. I know we got kids in here, so don't be looking at them that certain way. And that was the only thing that was talked about our imagination. Don't have bad thoughts. Don't have bad thoughts. Well, if my imagin imagination can cause me to sin, couldn't my imagination cause me to live righteously? If my imagination would cause me to lash out on my spouse or lash out on my friend or lash out on my coworker, couldn't my imagination cause me to walk in love? Now, Jesus makes this statement. He makes this statement over in, uh, in Matthew. Let me pull this up here. Matthew chapter 5. Jesus says this about, about our thoughts. Matthew 5 and verse 27. I'll let you turn over there. I want you to see this. Because this, this might be one that's kind of a shocker. But Matthew chapter 5 and verse 27. He says, your ancestors have been taught. Never commit adultery. However, I say to you, if you look with lust in your eyes at a woman who's not your wife, You've already committed adultery in your hearts. So Jesus is letting us know that, you know, under the old covenant, the physical act is what you got you in trouble. But under, under the law of grace, under this covenant of grace that we have, see, people have a wrong idea of grace. They think it's a license to sin. No, Jesus is saying under, under grace, actually, the ceiling goes even higher. But he's giving you the ability to do it. But he's letting you know here, under the law, he said the physical act is what was sin. He said under grace, under this, under this new covenant, just, just having the thoughts and imaginations of the physical act is just as much sin. Now this is where it gets interesting. He's letting you know that with your imaginations you can sin. Right? I mean, that's pretty plain right there. With your thoughts, your imaginations, you can sin. Now, we saw yesterday that sin is the root. The, the curse is the root of all the junk, all the garbage that you see in the world. Depression, addiction, mental issues, sickness, disease, poverty, lack. And I'm not talking about because somebody sinned. We're talking about the sin of Adam that released the curse into the world. We saw it very evident. Jesus compared the two, talked about the two. So here's the deal. If I could sin with my thoughts, is it possible I could get sick with my thoughts? Well, I think that'd be pretty safe to say, yeah. You know, there's this thing called medical student syndrome. 
And you, you, you look at these doctors that are going through school and they're training, and they refer to as medical student syndrome, uh, second year you know, student syndrome. And what happens is what they've been finding, they've been seeing this since the 60s, they've been studying. These students, they go into medical school, and their second year, they really start studying these diseases. And over, over that, the course of that, that second year of studying the diseases, all of a sudden, these students start experiencing the symptoms of the diseases that they're studying. And they've reported they start having dreams about these diseases. They start having the pains and the aches and the hurts of these diseases. Why? Because their thoughts, their imaginations are on them every single day, all day. And what is on your imagination, it will produce in your life. You will begin to think that that is your reality. We've seen this to happen all the time. And I do not think that it's just a coincidence that every time you cut on the TV, you can't watch the television for 15 minutes without seeing three or four ads about a disease. Because the world is hammering this and hammering this and hammering this that you being sick is normal. And we want to let you know about all the diseases that are out there and all the symptoms that are out there and the diagnosis and the prognosis. So you'll buy into the system, so you'll buy into our system. And isn't it interesting? I mean, you know, we, we joked about it last night, but I mean, you can watch a, a one-minute ad on, on a medication that they're trying. Now, now, I've always wondered, why are they trying to sell you the medication? I mean, you can't go buy it. You got to go to your doctor. And the doctors are the only ones that can actually get it from the pharmaceutical companies to give it to you. But who are they trying to sell it to? You. But what are they trying to sell to you? They're not really trying to sell you the medication. They're trying to sell you the disease. And they're trying to sell you all the symptoms. Because you watch. I mean, I watched one just yesterday. And I, I was, we were joking about it last night. It's funny, but it's not. But it is funny. But you watch it. I mean, 10 seconds... The first 10 seconds, they're telling you about all the wonderful benefits. It'll take care of this pain, this hurt. It'll take care of that headache. For, for the last 45 seconds, they tell you how to make you blind, give, make you deaf, make you impotent, give you a stroke, make you have a heart attack. But hey, to get rid of that headache. <laughs> I mean, you may be walking around like this for the rest of your life and can't have any kids, but my head don't hurt anymore. I mean, it's just over and over. They, they mentioned one this morning. It came on while we were getting dressed, and Lacey's like, what's that? And I'm looking at it. It's something. I've never heard of this particular disease before. You know, I've never heard of it. There's stuff that's been coming up over the last 10 years. It wasn't even an issue years ago. All these symptoms, and people hear this enough, and all of a sudden, I got a pain right here. Or I got a pain right here. And I start wondering, well, what was that? Well, I mean, I've been hearing all these commercials on YouTube and Instagram and, and Facebook and, and on Hulu and Netflix and all this type of stuff. And I've been hearing about this stuff. So then I go on Google. And what do I do? That's the worst thing you could ever do. You go on Google and you start Googling the symptoms. And then it starts bringing up all of these possible scenarios of, of how you could possibly die. And yet, we don't go to the, the minor. We go to the worst of the worst possible scenario. And we start allowing our thoughts and our, our imaginations to begin to, to run wild on that. And all of a sudden, now we're in a place that we're, we're anxious and we're concerned and we're worried. And you know what? Satan just won. Amen. Why? He can't make you sin. And this is a shocker to most of the church. He can't make you sick either. The, uh, see, that's why people got quiet. We said he can't make you sin. Everybody said amen. Said he can't make you sick, and it was <laughs> But he has no authority. Remember, all authority with us, no authority with him. It's not only the same thing with sin, it's also the same with sickness, disease. Jesus said the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I came that you would have life. Now, isn't it interesting over in 1 Peter and many of you know this, it says, we are to cast our cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. Anybody ever heard that? Why don't you look at that? 1 Peter chapter uh, 4, I believe. Is it 1 Peter 4? Yeah. 1 Peter chapter 4. Or 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, and in verse 6. It says, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that he would exalt you in due time, casting all of your cares upon him, 
for he cares for you. I remember having verse 7 talk to me as a little kid and, and, and children's church at church. That was one of our memory scriptures. We grew up hearing that. Cast your cares upon the Lord, for he cares for you. But did you notice the very next verse? It says, be sober, be, vig be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Notice, he can't just devour you. Why? He has no authority. He's looking for the ones who will give him that ability. Well, who are those people? It's the people with the cares. It's the people with the worries. It's the people with the, with the anxieties. He said, cast all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. But be vigilant, be sober. The devil's walking around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in the faith. What are you to resist? The cares. What are, you to, you, what are you to resist? The worries, the fears, the anxiety, the depression. What are you to resist? The cares. If you do not devour the cares, the cares are going to devour you. If you do not devour the cares, the cares are going to devour you. And that is how Satan gets an inroad into our life. He's trying to bring these thoughts and these ideas and these suggestions to get you to begin to care and imagine all of the worst possible things that could possibly happen in that situation. Isn't it interesting when you go to the doctor? They don't want to hear about the side of the family that has good health. They only want to hear about the side who everybody died because of heart attacks and cancer and liver disease and heart disease. They don't want to talk about the good side. They want to talk about the bad side. Why is it that you only want to hear about the people that had bad health problems on this one side? What about this whole other side? Everyone's been healthy, everyone's been free, everyone's lived to be an old age. Why do you want to only talk about the bad stuff? Well, that's why the church only does that. We only focus on the sin piece. We only focus what our imagination could do in the area of sin. But if I could sin with my thoughts, I could live righteously with my thoughts. If I could get sick with my thoughts, you know what? I could also get healed with my thoughts. If I could produce sickness and disease, if that gives me an inroad, you know what? That's good news because all i got to do is unplug from death because of my imaginations. And with my imaginations, I plug into the life of God. And now I begin to see myself healed. I begin to see myself seeing. I begin to see myself walking when I couldn't walk. I begin to see myself living to an old age, even though the doctor said you got six months to live. Isn't it interesting that, that when God began to speak to Abraham about having a child, and yet the Bible says that Abraham was old. and says Sarah was old, and she was past the age of, of, of having a child. And what does God do? He not only gives him the promise, but then he tells Abraham, I want you to go outside, I want you to look at the stars. And I want you to try to count the stars. All of those stars represent all of your seed. Those represent all of the children, all of the people, all the generations that are going to come from you. What did God begin to work on with Abraham? He began to work on his imaginations, and as a result, he was going to work on his faith. See, we've been so focused on the faith piece, what we really need to be focused on is our imaginations, because our imaginations are wh is which our faith is going to hook up with. See, again, you think you've got a faith problem. Your faith is working all the time. Just usually we're using it on the sin side. We're using it on the depression side, the anxiety side. And that's where things become real and we release our faith on that and we're not even trying. And it's because you are a faith person. You are made in the image and likeness of God. Believing is what believers do best. It's like Tigger, you know. Tigger is jumping is what we do best. Believing is what believers do best. It's not something I have to try to do. It's innately something I just do. Why? I was made in his image. I was made in his likeness. Believing is just a natural part of me. The problem is, what do you believe in? But the bigger problem is, what is your mind stayed on? What is your mind stayed on? So what does God do with Abraham? He tells Abraham, I want you to go and look at the stars. I want you to try to count the stars. And then he doesn't just start with the nighttime. He says, and during the day, I want you to go out and try to count the sand of the seashore. So he's giving him something to look at during the day, and he's giving him something to look at at night. All day. 
And yet, isn't it interesting, you go back and read in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, and and God would tell people like Joshua, he said, I want you to meditate day and night. Meditate on this word day and night so you'll know what to do. You, You find King David through the Psalms talking about meditating, meditating, meditating. What is he talking about? You using your imagination. Using your imagination to see yourself the way that God made you to be. Using your imagination to see yourself doing the things that you should do. The business world has got this figured out. The church has just been absolutely ignorant to it. Because you go to business school, you listen to some of these business gurus, and they talk about, I want you to see yourself making that deal. They teach it in these classes. See yourself making that big deal. See yourself, you know, going and getting that office space. See yourself buying this or buying that. See yourself you know, having this office and this amount of employees. See yourself doing that. They're talking about your vision. Well, where is your vision produced from? Your imagination. Your imagination. Friends, let's just be honest. This is why when, over the last two years, you saw a whole bunch of people going buck wild crazy and, and, and their imaginations and thoughts about certain things that were going on. And then you had another group of people who weren't going so crazy. And just living life like normal for the most part. Why? Because one group of people is watching everything that the news and all of the experts and all the other little spurts are just spurting in your mind and telling you all these fearful, worried things. And then you got another group that just like, forget all of that. I ain't listening to that. And I've, I've watched it. I mean, different states, different countries, I've watched it. And those that are just paying attention to every little, being like a little baby bird. And everything Mama Bird just puts in the mouth, just sucking it dry from, from the media and governments. And, and I'm talking about all over the world. Those that were doing that, I mean, scared. We had a neighbor that, that uh, lives actually right beside us. This woman wouldn't leave her house for a year and a half. Literally stayed in her house because she was scared to get sick. She was scared to get sick. Now, again, I'm not stupid. I'm not denying that there aren't sicknesses and diseases out there. But what I'm talking about is the fact of what are you putting your mind on? Because what you put your mind on, that's going to be your reality. And what is your reality? That's what you're going to put your faith on. And what you put your faith on, that's what you're going to experience. That's what you're going to experience. God understands this. Satan understands this. At some point, the church has got to understand this. Satan could not make Eve sin. What did he do? He brought bring a thought, idea, suggestion to get her to imagine. And her imagination turned into a manifestation. God could not get Abraham just to actually produce this. So what did he do? He began to, to bring these thoughts and ideas and suggestions. He got Abraham to begin to use his imagination during the night, use his imagination during the day. He began to see himself being a father of many nations, even though he wasn't even a father to one child. What, he was trying to work on his imagination. What is Satan trying to do with you? He's trying to work on your imaginations to get you to see yourself a different way. A different way. Now let's finish up here in Romans chapter, uh, Romans chapter 8. We looked at this yesterday a little bit, but I want you to see it in this light. Romans chapter 8, and let's just look at verse, verse 1, and we'll read from there. Romans 8, 1. There's no condemnation to those who are where? Those who are in Christ, in that position, in Him, there's no condemnation. There's, there's nothing coming against you and saying that you're not good enough, you're not righteous enough, you're not holy enough. There's nothing coming against you saying that you can't pray for that person and get a result. There's nothing coming against you and saying this is impossible, as long as you're in that position of in Him. And he goes on to say in verse 2, For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus, notice it set me free from the law of sin and death. The law of heaven is the law of life. Life. This Zoe life we talked about yesterday. The life of God. It's the law of life that we are to live by. Now go on to verse 5. Romans chapter 8 and verse 5. He said, those who live according to the flesh. You could say those who live according to the world. The world's ideas. They set their minds on the things of the flesh. They do what with their mind? They set it there. They set their mind there. You know, I remember growing up in the, in the early 80s, because, you know, back then we still didn't have uh, TV, you know, on all the time. So about midnight, shuts off, you know, they got the American flag and we sing the, 
do the Pledge of Allegiance at midnight in the living room, you know, and, and then shh. But right before that, they started doing these infomercials. And for whatever reason, I still remember this as a kid. This one guy, his name was Ronco. You all remember what they, some, some of the old ones remember? Ronco. And he'd have all of these gadgets. And he had this one, I still remember this from a kid. He had this one gadget. It was a rotisserie chicken maker. And, <laughs> and their slogan, their, their sales pitch was this. Set it and forget it. It's just that easy. Just set it, put the chicken in there, set it, forget it. You can walk away. You come back and you've got a great rotisserie chicken. The Ronco rotisserie chicken maker. I'm telling you, it made an influence on, on a seven-year-old child. <laughs> I still remember that. Set it and forget it. But see, I would stay up late, and that, was, and that was the only thing left on at late, and so they'd have the same infomercial on every day for a while, and they kept talking about this rotisserie chicken maker. They still do? <laughs> rotisserie chicken maker, you know, 10.5 or something like that now. But that was the thing, set it and forget it. But notice what he's talking about. Those who do what with their mind? They set it. We're not talking about the casual fleeting thought that comes. You have that thought and then you cast away. You can't keep the thoughts from coming your way. But you can choose what thoughts you're going to meditate on. One wise man said this. He said, you can't keep the birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from making a nest. You can't keep them from making a nest. You can't keep them from making it. You can't, you can't keep the thoughts from coming, but you can choose what you're going to think on. This is not about a casual thought. This is about a continuous meditation of what I'm putting my mind on. And he said those who set their minds on the things of the flesh, what is it? They set their minds on the things of flesh. Or they, those who live according to the things of flesh set their minds on the things of flesh. Those who live according to the Spirit, they set their minds on the things of the Spirit. Notice verse 6. To be carnally minded is what? Death. To be fleshy minded, to be worldly minded is going to produce death. And he's talking to Christians here. That means you could be saved in your spirit, going to heaven. But if you still think like a sinner, if you still think like the world, is going to produce sinner results. It's going to produce world results. You could be saved, but if you're still thinking like a sinner, it's still going to produce hell in your life. And this right here is the reason you got so many billions of Christians who, when they take their last breath, thank God they get to go to heaven. But while they're waiting to go to heaven, they're, they're sitting there and saying, I'm just living like hell. Go, and this, I'm just going through hell all the time. Why? Why are you going through hell? Because you got hell on your mind. I'm not talking about you think you're going to go to hell, but you're thinking that the hellish perspective, the sin curse perspective, that I, there's nothing I can do about this situation. I guess this is just my lot in life. You know, say a traumatic situation happened. Well, I guess that was just God's plan for me, and now I just got to deal with it. And Satan starts bringing these thoughts, and then starts telling you how bad life is going to be. And what are you going to do without that person? What are you going to do with this, without this person? I mean, you have nothing to live for anymore. Those are the thoughts that start coming to people. You know, trauma happens. Physical abuse happens. And Satan brings these thoughts and says, see, the reason that happened, because you aren't worth anything anyway. That's why that happened. And, you know, you weren't worth anything anyway, and that's why that person did that to you. So you ought to just take your life. You just get on out of here. Life would be a whole lot better on the other side for you anyway. Satan don't give a rip if you go to heaven. Why? He just wants you out of here. Because it's here where you can cause damage to him. So what does he do? He brings the thoughts. He brings the ideas. And he brings the suggestions. And he always waits for those times you sit down just to try to be quiet. And have you noticed every time you sit down to be quiet, all of a sudden, it's like boom. And the thoughts start coming, just bombarded. Just beat, 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 over and over and over, just pounding and pounding. The thoughts and the ideas and suggestions of your worthlessness, your hopelessness. And yet... If you would just grab a hold of those thoughts and do what Paul said in Corinthians, you cast down those thoughts. All those thoughts that come your way, that exalt themselves against the realities and truths of who you are in Christ. He said, if you'll grab a hold of those thoughts, take them captive and cast those things down. Paul spends more time in the Bible talking about your thought life than anything else. 
He makes this statement in Colossians chapter 3, verse 1 through 3. He says, set your mind on the realities of heaven. For you died, and your life, your new life, is now hidden with Christ in God. Stop thinking and seeing like an earthling. Stop seeing things, seeing your situations like someone who's disconnected and away from God. In Romans chapter 12 and verse 2, he said, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by what? By the renewing of your mind, by the changing of the way that you think, by the, by the changing of your imaginations, so that you can prove what is a good, acceptable, and perfect will of God. Notice he didn't say so God could do anything. He said so you could prove God's perfect will. Well, what's God's will? God's will is heaven on earth. Anybody ever heard the Lord's Prayer? That was what God, Jesus prayed. Father, your will be done on, heaven, done on earth as it is in heaven. That's the will of God. He wants heaven in your marriage. He wants heaven in your finances, heaven in your business, heaven in your relationships, heaven in your home, heaven in your health. But how is that going to happen? It's not going to be because we begged and we pleaded and we, and, 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 and we just we pestered God long enough so he got finally tired of hearing us and so he, he decided to do something. No. It's going to come because we get a hold of our imaginations and we begin to think and we begin to chew on and we begin to meditate on the truths and the realities of God and what he's done for us, what he's done in us, and what he's endeavoring to do through us so that we can prove the will of God in our life. So if we don't like what we're experiencing, then maybe we need to check up on our imaginations. Maybe we need to check up what we're thinking on all the time. Maybe we need to check up on what we're thinking about in those quiet times when we sit down just to chill. Isn't it interesting that when you sit down to begin to maybe spend some time to read your Bible, all of a sudden, all these to-do lists start coming to you. You go to spend some time praying in tongues for a little bit, and all of a sudden you start remembering where you lost your car keys. Uh, all these thoughts start coming to you. I've been there, done that all the time. All these thoughts start coming. I mean, you could, you've been looking for your keys for three hours, couldn't find it. You sit down to spend some time reading or spend time praying, and all of a sudden, boom, I just remember where it was at. <laughs> Satan's bringing these thoughts. Why? Because he can't make you do anything. So he's bringing these thoughts. This is what he did with, uh, this is what he did with Judas Iscariot, who, who betrayed Jesus. The Bible says that, that Satan filled Judas' heart with these thoughts to do this. If you read in, over in Acts about Ananias and Sapphira, you know, they went to church and they lied about some things and died. All right. Anyway, the Bible says, the Bible says that Satan filled their hearts, brought these temptations and filled their hearts with this idea to lie about the sell of what they were doing. Satan couldn't make them do that, but what did he do? He bring the thought, the idea. And the suggestion, it's all about what is your mind on. It's all about what is your mind on. It's all about what's your mind on. There's a wonderful, wonderful story that we saw last night. It's in Numbers chapter 21 when Moses and the, and the Israelites were dealing with the snakes. The Israelites sin because they were complaining and griping. And these snakes show up and they're biting them. They're being poisoned and they're dying. So they come and, and they, they say, Moses, we're stupid. We shouldn't have done that. Moses goes to God. God says, Moses, I want you to take a pole. And I want you to make a bronze serpent and put it on that pole. And he said, everyone who gazes at that serpent, even if they've been bitten, they will live. And it's absolutely, it's absolutely phenomenal because even though they've got snakes crawling all over them, even though they're being bitten, even though they've got blood coming out of their leg, they've got poison trying to get into their body, God's not denying the circumstances. He's not denying the situation. And he's not telling them to deny the snakes that are all around. What God said is, in spite of what you see, in spite of what you feel, in spite of what is going on all around you, if you'll just keep your eyes, if you'll keep your gaze, if you'll keep your imaginations on that pole, then no matter if you've been bitten, you will live. And friends, that is where you and I are today. Nobody is telling you to deny the reality of the situation that's out here. Nobody's telling you to deny the reality of the financial problems, physical problems, marital problems, business issues. Nobody's denying those things. We're not stupid. We're not denying that. 
But what God's telling you is, despite what you see, hear, feel, taste, touch, change your gaze. Set your mind not on the realities of this world. Set your mind on the realities of heaven. Set your mind on the will of heaven. What's real for you? What's real for you? And what's that going to do? It's going to change your perception. And as your perception gets changed, that's what's going to become your reality. And what is your reality? That's what your faith is going to produce out of this imagination factory. This is how you get set free. If you've been depressed, i got good news for you. You don't have to be depressed anymore. If you've been suffering with anxiety and panic attacks, I've got good news for you. You don't have to suffer with that anymore. Uh, you know, James opened up with that. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. And you know what? He's provided healing for that. But he can't stop the thoughts from coming to your mind, and he can't make you choose on what you're going to think on. You are going to have to get your fight on and make a decision. I will not think on these things. There's a reason Paul told you, set your mind on the reality. He didn't say pray that God would change your thoughts. God, God can't change your thoughts. You can, and only you can. Your pastor can't, I can't, your spouse can't. You are the one who has to choose your thoughts. And if you have allowed your mind just to run wild for years and years and years, I, I've got some news for you. It's not just going to happen overnight. Because Satan realizes... He, he, he's smart in one way because as your enemy, he knows where your weak spot is at. And I don't know about you, but I grew up playing sports. And when I was playing sports, we'd go out and scout teams. And we'd see what their strengths were. And we'd see what their weaknesses were. And we didn't attack their strengths. We attacked their weakness. And Satan knows what your weak spots are. And so if you find yourself being tempted in a particular area over and over and over and over and over, you know what? That's your weak spot. But the good news is, now you know what to fix. There's areas in my life that I'm always looking, I'm always analyzing myself. And I'm looking, okay, where, where am I being attacked at? That's my sign. I need to work on that. I need to work on There are some things that I was working on in my mind as I was driving yesterday to go pick them up. And my imaginations. It was good stuff. But I, I was working on my imaginations to make certain things seem smaller. Because they were just too big in my mind. It's working my imaginations to make it small. In the area of sickness and disease, you need to start seeing yourself healed. If you need to print out pictures, if you can't walk, if you need to print out pictures of you and, and draw some little legs on it, you walking down, if you need to see that, you put that up on the wall. You put that on the refrigerator. If you've been going along and you've had bad reports, bad blood reports or whatever from the doctor, go and print you one up, showing your name and your social and show good numbers on that and put that on the refrigerator. Put that on your bathroom mirror and see yourself. Start changing the way that you see those reports. Start changing the way that you see yourself. If you see yourself as broke and, and busted and disgusted like I did as a kid, hey, I went and started getting pictures of cars and stuff that, that I thought I would never be able to do. I remember when the Ford Expeditions came out back in the, in the 90s, mid-late mid, uh, mid 90s. I mean, I was like, there's no way I could ever have something like that. I mean, it shows you how far I've come along, you know. And so I went, I went to the Ford dealership. This is before I could print out stuff on the internet. Went to the Ford dealership. I went and got one of their little books. I took one that was free, and I cut out a picture of that Ford Expedition. And I put it on the wall. And then I went and cut out a picture of me from high school. Cut out the face, and I stuck it in the driver's seat. <laughs> and I had that on my wall for, 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 for years, just so I could see myself there see myself there and I finally got to the point where where that that vehicle didn't seem like that big of a deal to me and we're all we're all in different places whether it's for finances whether it's a you know a mate a spouse kids you know if you're somebody and and, and you haven't been able to have kids you need to start changing your vision go start looking at kids stuff start printing out pictures go 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 to Walmart buy one of those picture frames that already has a picture of a cute little kid in it put it in your house just to walk around and see pictures of little kids in your house. Change the way that you think. Why? Because Satan has no authority in your life. You're no longer a slave. You're no longer a slave to sin. You're no longer a slave to sickness. You're no longer a slave to depression. You're no longer a slave to addiction. You're no longer a slave to cancer. You're no longer a slave to Parkinson's. You're no longer a slave to diabetes. You're no longer a slave to anything that's associated with a curse. Because Jesus really and truly absolutely sets you free of it. 
He absolutely set you free from it. Hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. So I want to do one thing before we go here. I don't like going without doing this. If you come here this morning, and first of all, you say, Chad, I've never made Jesus the Lord and Savior in my life. Well, the bad news is that right now you're a slave. You have, <laughs> you have no say-so. But the good news is one decision can absolutely radically change that. And you go from being a slave to a master. If you've never made Jesus the Lord and Savior your life, I want you to just pray this very simple prayer with me. Everybody can hear can just pray it along with me so nobody feels singled out or looked at or anything. But just say this with me. Say, God, I come to you right now. I realize I need a Savior. I believe in my heart. And I confess with my mouth that Jesus died for me and arose again from the dead just for me. I thank you for making me a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. Old things are gone, and a new life has begun for me right now in Jesus' name. Amen. So if you prayed that prayer, that's the very first time you've done that, congratulations. You're a brand new creature in Christ. Old things have gone. It may not seem like anything's changed here, but you're brand new. But this is where now you've got you to gotta get hooked up in church. You've got to get hooked up. Go to these Bible studies, these small groups they're talking about. Learn who you are so you can experience heaven on earth in, in your life and in your relationship. So that way, when you, when you eventually take your last breath or Jesus shows up and you go to heaven, you're not so shocked. Because life has just been that good. Praise the Lord. Well, say it with me, the Lord's good. And His mercies endure forever. The Lord is good. And his mercies endure forever. Now personalize it. The Lord is good to me. And his mercies endure toward me. Forever and ever and ever. Hallelujah. How about now? There we go. I can tell you one thing. That was awesome. <laughs> Amen. That was awesome. I know, um, I know before we leave that there is the Lord just laying something on my heart. And what we're going to do is we're going to, I'm going to ask our normal, our normal prayer warriors, Frank, if you could come, come down as well. And I, I believe that this is something that I, the Lord's just showing me that what we need to do, because this is, this is not just about Chad being here, okay? This is something that, is, that goes deeper than that. And Chad and his family are leaving, you know, after our service today. They're going, and they're going to get to do some amazing, get to, get to spend some family time. But as he mentioned from the beginning, <clears throat> this is not about him having everything, Okay, this is about us. And that if you if you have been here for six months, a year, two years, you have heard this over and over again. We've been talking about this life of Christ in you. And what we want you to understand is that this is a normal thing. Okay, so if there's something that's going on in your body, we want to pray for you. Okay, this is something that the Lord's just showing me that we need to do as Cowboy Church. Okay, this is something that we're going to do. If there's something going on inside of you, if, if there's something that you need prayer for, if you need us to agree with you that the life of Christ is in you for the first time, the Lord's showing me that anxiety's coming off of somebody right now, that fear's coming off. All of these things that we have been, that have been binding you for so long, I believe that today, it, I know it's, it's going. He's already, he's already showed me, okay? So, Ash, if, or some of the band, if you guys could come up for just a second, I'm gonna, I'm, we're just going to close in prayer. But if I could get Miss Kathy, Miss Cindy, if you could come, that'd be awesome. Some of our normal people, that some normal faces. And as we, as we begin to, to pray, if the altar's going to be open, this is something that I, I, want, I want to do. I just, I really want to do that. that and I, if you need prayer, stay where you're at, raise your hand. We'll come to you. How's that? We'll come to you if you need prayer. And anybody who, who, who just is uh, feeling like they need, they need specifically anything specific prayer, you can come forward, you can go backwards, you can sit right where you're at. We'll, Jesus will meet you right there. So if you need prayer this morning, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand.
Okay, we got hands going up. Frank, Cindy, just grab somebody on your way. Miss Kathy, get after it. Miss Sassy. Chris. And I'm, I'm going to begin to pray, and I'm, gonna, I'm just going to pray what the Lord is just showing me, some specific things. And if that's you, come on. Father God, I thank you so much for who you are, Lord Jesus. I thank you for the life of Christ in each one of us. Father, I thank you for the activation that happened inside of people to this morning. Father, in this weekend, Lord, I thank you for that. Father, I thank you for the life of Christ, the union of Christ that we know is there, that we thought for so long we compartmentalized and we put it so far off to the left and we put it so far off to the right and we buried it with excuses. We buried it with excuses because our imagination said that it was okay based on what Satan had said. But we learned this morning that our imagination, whenever it's rooted and it's grounded in the word of God, we have dominion and we have authority over those things. So right now, in Jesus' name, anybody who is experiencing fear, anxiety, anything like that, this is, this, we're going after this right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I break that fear over right now, over every single person who's bound by fear. Father, for an, any anxiety, any, anybody struggling with anxiety this morning? Okay? Hands going up everywhere. Right now, in Jesus' name, I bind anxiety. I release the, the life of God into, into you right now. Father, we love you. We thank you. Right now, Father, we thank you for that. We thank you for that. Uh -huh. 